This is October 9th, 2007, and we are in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today William N. Eckerson. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Joan. May I ask you when you were born? August 21st, 1922. And where were you born? Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And did you grow up in Pittsfield? Yes, I did. Where do you live now? I live in Boxford, Massachusetts. And your marital status? Uh, yes, I'm married. And do you have children? I have four children. Grandchildren? Eight. And, and three great-grandchildren. Three great-grandchildren. That's fantastic. <laughs> Congratulations. Where and when did you enter the military? Uh, December 7th, 1941, I was a sophomore at Colgate University. And were you called up at that time? or uh, No, my dad uh, called to say that uh, I was about to get drafted. He hoped I could stay in school. Um, but we all were getting calls at that time because we were 19, 20 years old. And so we decided that we wanted to get this world over, this war over, and a typical age group that figured we could do it ourselves. We wanted to be sure we got in it, so about 20 of us uh, signed up with the Marine Corps or went to a recruiting station in Syracuse nearby to uh, sign up. And uh, physical requirements were very stiff in those days. Um, you couldn't be colored blind, you couldn't be too tall, too short, you had to have so many teeth, which eliminated some of the football players. So when we got back to the fraternity house, there was only about 10 of us that passed. Um, but I was in the Marine Corps and they informed me that they would call me up as soon as they could. But uh, Paris Island was, the training center was signed up for, for some time in the future and they hoped that I would stay and continue at school because if I should graduate before they called me up, I could be a candidate for officer's candidate school. And that's what you did then? That's what I did. I, we started our junior year one week after our sophomore year in May of 42 and uh, went year round, took extra courses and in June of 1943 I graduated and the Marine Corps called me up within a week. So you graduated from Colgate and then yes. in 43, the summer of 43, they called you up, you weren't yeah. even fresh out of school. I was, still, I, I, was, I was still at school when I got the notice uh, that they were going to call me up because they understood I was graduating within the, the next week or so. Why did you choose the Marine Corps? Well, as I said, as a good 19-year-old thinking uh, we wanted to be where the action was. And uh, it's hard to believe, but that's the reason why we joined the Marine Corps. And did those 10 others also get called up right away? Yes, they did, yes. And did you all go to Paris Island at yes, that point? Yes, we did. What was it like? Well, Paris Island was a very dramatic change in my lifestyle. Um, I was introduced to discipline. Um, one of the things that uh, challenged me more than anything else was when we fell out, uh, uh, attention, right face, forward march, we were never told where we were going. I don't think I'd ever gone anywhere in my life where I didn't know where I was going to go. We could be getting shots that were going to temporarily paralyze us or we could have been going to get a haircut, you know, one of those things. So it was interesting to realize that that was quite a challenge to me because I'd never thought of that before. Um, the drill instructor uh, welcomed us uh, at that point because it's now July 1st, 1943 as the greatest draft dodgers on the earth and uh, pursued uh, to make very sure that uh, our class, two large platoons, um, could take orders before we were ever in a position to give orders. And uh, we drilled in the sand before we ever drilled on the macadam. And, uh, we had some very humorous experiences. I recall one fellow from, uh, uh, I think he was from Idaho, and he walked and his shoulders bounced up and down. So 
So the drill instructor got right behind him and, and marched with him, and every time his shoulders went up and down, he'd hit him with his swagger stick. And in no time at all, those shoulders never went up and down. And he said, you're from Idaho? Yeah, he said, I suppose there's a lot of potato fields out there. Yeah, and you've been walking across those potato fields, haven't you? I re recall that as a, one of the more humorous aspects. Another great big fellow that was a tackle on the University of Pennsylvania team, we all turned left and he turned right by mistake. The drill instructor called us all at attention, got him out in front and said, why do you think you went right and the rest of us all went left? And this great big guy said, sir, I think I was nervous. <laughs> and we just couldn't <laughs> imagine him ever being nervous. Sure, sure. And we also were on the rifle range for two solid weeks, fired every weapon the Marine Corps had from morning till night. Uh, great training on weaponry. And uh, it was, that was a great experience, too. And that was still at um, Paris Island? Paris Island, yes. We were there for two months, called boot camp. Now, were you, did you know at the time, too, that you were training also to be an officer? Yes. Okay. When uh, we were called up, we, if we got through our basic training and qualified, we would go directly to uh, officer's candidate school. So you were two months in basic training. Yes. Then what? We went to <coughs> Excuse Quantico, me. Virginia, which is where the Marine Corps officer's candidate schools are. And we had a, a lot of field work, but also classroom. And the classroom was in addition to much of the training that we'd had. And what kind of classroom? Well, we'd have courses on map, map reading, compass, um, celestial, um, uh, chemical warfare, military tactics, military history. And at the time, were you getting news about the war? Yes, uh, we sure were. Uh, at Paris Island, uh, we met some of the uh, fellows who were on Guadalcanal, and uh, we got so many very many interesting stories from them. And while we were in uh, OCS, uh, uh, the Battle of Tarawa took place, and uh, they lost a lot of second lieutenants. So we, we were all hoping to become platoon leaders as a result of this training. And those friends from Colgate were still with you? Yes, yes, we, uh, we had some washouts, but I think all our fellows came through. I, I remember some outstanding athletes uh, on the football field from other colleges uh, couldn't get through the drill because uh, they'd never been out on a football field where they hadn't had their ankles taped. And, and drilling in sand, uh, you, you, you can't be flat-footed uh, uh, for very long. Sure. And how long were you in Quantico? We were there for OCS for uh, th two, three months and then officers training where we are taught to be platoon leaders and, and work with uh, local basic troops um, and, the, and becoming familiar with a, the, what a, a platoon leader did. And so we were there for six months from 1st of October to 1st of March. And then what? Then we were assigned uh, and, and I was one of the fortunate to go to uh, Fleet Marine Force, which is uh, at Camp Pendleton in Oceanside, California. And uh, I was assigned to Fox Company, 2nd Battalion, 26th Regiment, 5th Marine Division, and I was a platoon leader. And H had you ever traveled before out of Pittsfield? And I've been to Michigan to visit an uncle. And that was it? I've been to New York City from Pittsfield, and I didn't that do much it. traveling during the Depression. So along with your learning experiences to become an officer and, and uh, yeah. at Camp Pendleton, uh, a platoon leader, yeah. was it also an adventure for you seeing other parts of the country? Yes, it was. Um, yes, we went by train uh, across the country uh, to, to California and uh, to, uh, in, in March, which is meant it was cold and snow on the ground in Pittsville. I had two weeks to get there, and so uh, it was a major change. And once in Camp Pendleton, and you were given more responsibilities, yes. how long were you there? Um, we, we arrived uh, the first week of March, uh, I guess around the middle of March, and we left for the Pacific in the middle of June. 
And did you know right away that you would be going to the Pacific? Well, that's where the Marines were going, yes, yes. Our main responsibility was ship to shore uh, maneuvers. And that's where, that was our specialty, was going from ship to islands where we had to take over. Uh, so all the Marines were in the Pacific, with very few exceptions in combat. So were you in direct combat? Yes, I was. Talk about that. Well, um, we did not know where we were going. Um, we, when we left for the Pacific, we went to a forward staging area in the large island of Hawaii, which is called Hawaii, and we uh, trained up in the Parker Ranch, which is a, between Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa on the big island of Hawaii. It was called Camp Tarawa because that's where the second division trained before they went to Tarawa. Um, so we were there for another six months. So we had almost a year's training as a unit, which is which is a wonderful thing because it it was helpful uh, in in uh, in our uh, Battle of Iwo. Uh, we did not know where we were going to. We were aboard ship, uh, and then we were given all the information of what was going to happen and where we were going to go and what our responsibility was. So we had. Plenty of opportunity to prepare for that because it took us uh, from January 3rd till February 19th to get there. Uh, it's a, the Pacific is one big ocean. And so we, we, uh, we arrived and um, the estimate, estimated time that it was going to take us to, to secure this island now was you about briefly, five days. I'm sorry, I don't no. mean to interrupt, but you briefly mentioned Iwo. Yes. So you didn't know, but it took you a month to go from Hawaii to Iwo Jima. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, so yeah, that's continue right. on. I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt, but I wanted no, it clear okay. for yes, the people okay. listening in. So we, uh, Iwo Jima, was, the D-Day was February 19th, and we were in the initial assault. We, um, our objective was to cross the island. Uh, our unit was in reserve, so the uh, first waves landed about 9 o'clock in the morning. We arrived uh, later about noontime, went across the island and saw our first dead Marine. I think my initial reaction to that was, uh, this is a very dangerous place to be, number one. Number two, um, that death is going to cause an awful lot of grief to an awful lot of family that do not know about this yet. Um, the, the most difficult part was that uh, the Japanese had all the tactical advantages. They had the height, that Mount Suribachi was right on to our left, and they were spraying us with uh, machine gun fire and mortars and artillery the whole time. Um, we, uh, you couldn't find a pillbox until they fired at you. It was so well camouflaged. And talk about what a pillbox is. A pillbox is a hidden entrenchment uh, usually manned by a machine gun crew uh, who has an opening just wide enough for the machine gun barrel to stick out. Um, you can identify it by its fire, uh, at which time our, our tactics were to return that fire so with as much ri many rifles and B B BARs and machine guns that we had so that our demolition and flamethrower people could get up there and blow it up. And so that was our, our job. The first night uh, we had gotten across in the island with not too many casualties, amazingly. Uh, amazingly. Um, but during the night we had a number of uh, first occasions, one being uh, at, at night you can hear th so many things. You can hear machine guns chugging away and uh, you can uh, hear all sorts of things that you don't hear during the day. Uh, one of them was a Japanese, uh, Japanese yelling at us, Marine, you die. Uh, that was, at first, stunned us. It, and that's not easy to do to Marines. But it, it, all the, and the line was very silent for a while. Um, we also realized they were trying to get us to yell back to them because that would give our position away a little bit. We're all dug in, but uh, that would give them a chance to know where we, exactly where we were. Um, but we finally recovered and, and um, and the, the appropriate responses uh, finally followed that uh, this was not going to, uh, uh, I guess I would say, um, 
I can't give you the exact word, but it was it was uh, it implied that we were not concerned about the fact that they said we were going to die. And at this point, you are twenty three years old, twenty two. Yes, years old? Uh, we landed in in nineteen forty five. So I was 22. 22 I, I was, years old. I wouldn't be 23 until August. And your ranking was at that time? My what, please? Your rank? I was a second lieutenant. So you, you mentioned it was so stunning to hear the sounds of the Japanese and also to yeah. see your first uh, Marine casualty and then other casualties. Yeah. You were a, a platoon leader, yeah. but you were only... 22 years old. Yeah. How did you personally feel? Well, I played a lot of athletics. I, you know, I played baseball, football, hockey. Uh, so I'd been in that type of situation. It wasn't, I never considered athletics a part of life or death, but I played like it was. And, uh, and so I, I had that leadership experience that carried me forward uh, as a platoon leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Marine Corps uh, has a tremendous respect for officers and uh, enlisted uh, were well trained and uh, we had a tremendous organization. So talk some more about having to cross the island. Earlier prior to our taping you had mentioned how small the island was. Yes. How small was it? Well, eight square miles. And. Tell us, not on a day-to-day -day basis, yeah. but in general, what happened? Well, we, uh, the first couple of days, we, uh, the first day we got across the island, so we now had a tie-in between the 3rd and 4th Marine Divisions, which also were on Iwo, and uh, the regiment from our division was responsible for Suribachi, and so that regiment was totally dedicated to trying to secure that. So we started heading north, one of the things you have to do tactically is to keep your lines together so that Japanese do not get infiltrated. However, every single large uh, pillbox was connected by tunnels throughout the whole, the whole island. And we could hear them underneath us, uh, going through tunnels and that sort of thing, jabbering away. And uh, so it, there was no room for any maneuvering whatsoever uh, to try and take the next hill. You only had one way to go, and that was straight ahead. There was no vegetation. There was airports on our right flank, so uh, they had the height from the edge of the airports to fire down on us. On the third day, we saw the flag go up on Iwo, which was a very wonderful experience because that meant that there were no, no more Japanese firing from, from there at us. And uh, it also was great for our morale to know that what was behind us now was secure. And of course that picture became famous and made the Battle of Iwo Jima very famous. Mm -hmm. um, so we moved up the island uh, going three or four hundred yards a day because uh, they had all the, all the height and they could just fire right down onto us until we got to them. What was the weather like? Well, that's, people don't, that's a good question because people don't ever hear much about it raining, but like the second night it poured. and. Um, the, the thing that's going to keep you alive are your weapons. So you get wet, but your weapon never gets wet. And with sand, if the sand ever gets into the mechanism, uh, you're, you're out of business. So um, that's a top priority when it rains, is to keep your weapons. We had ponchos to put over us, but uh, we made sure our weapons didn't get wet. That was the key. So it had to be very tense on a day-to-day -day basis if you're only going, as you said, 400 Plus. Yes, it, w it was because of the casualties we were taking. We were, we, uh, in my rifle company, uh, 250 men and seven officers and seven corpsmen, uh, four of the officers were killed moving up this island uh, because uh, the Japanese also had the observation of us and they would try and pick out who the leaders were and although you never had any insignia on you, people came to you. and. Uh, I have one experience that I relate because it, it, it tells that story pretty well. One of the uh, fellows in my platoon, I'll call him Don, uh, got hit by running from one foxhole and got hit by a mortar and the shell almost took his arm off and he was 
totally out of it, but he could move. His legs didn't get hit. And when you're in that condition, you usually run to authority. So I always had a corpsman with me. And he came running at me, and the corpsman and I grabbed him, and we could see the arm just hanging. Corman put it on a sling, uh, gave him a shot of morphine, got two stretcher bearers to take him away, and uh, I didn't see him again until at our reunion, 20 years later. And uh, so he came up to me, Lieutenant, how are you? They still call me Lieutenant. And uh, I said, I'm fine. I said, uh, how's your arm? He said, how do you know about my arm? I said, well, what do you remember? He said, uh, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I said, Hinch, what made you think you were going to heaven? Well, it turned out that he was in a basket and a cherry picker was taking him off a landing craft and putting him on a hospital ship and he came to from the morphine and all he saw were clouds and sky. He had no idea what had happened that whole period of time. Uh, but they sewed, they took ligaments out of his leg and they got his arm so that he could lift 10 pounds with that arm. And, uh, but he, he knew nothing about what happened, asked me to explain what I knew about it, so I was able to tell him So you were able to I fill saw. in all of fill that Fill in leg. all that time. And I couldn't help but think how different that was in the Civil and the Revolutionary War. They didn't have morphine. Right. They didn't have tourniquets. They made their own tourniquet. But we had a corpsman in each platoon. In, in our rifle company, we had two Medal of Honor winners, a corpsman and a private, and uh, both of them survived. Out of the 27 Medal of Honors that were awarded on Iwo, half of them were almost were posthumous. So, uh, uh, yes, that's that's the type of life we went through on Iwo. One of the questions is: Do you feel your officers, you being one, but other officers mm -hmm. were uh, gave good leadership? Oh yes, I, I think. Uh, we were very fortunate to be together almost a year because uh, in our training back at Camp Pendleton and at, in Hawaii, we would go out in the morning and we'd be gone all day and come back at night, which meant that um, we were together, you know, we would go out evenings and come back, but it, uh, in training we mostly came back to the barracks only because it facilitated the training. Um, but we spent a lot of time in the dark out in the canyons of, of California and Hawaii. Um, just talking to get used to one another's voices. And I subsequently, after the war, many years, met at these reunions, an officer who'd stayed in, who'd been at uh, um, Saipan, and uh, not Saipan, um, the other islands that they've been to, uh, uh, Korea, for example, is, is having stayed in after the war. He was, uh, he was a member of other rifle companies in combat, in Korea particularly, and uh, he said that, uh, we, that no one ever had that continuous training that we had for 12 months. So we were very well prepared to, uh, to handle most anything, but we had no room for all the maneuvering that we practiced and that sort of thing. Were you wounded in combat? Yes. Can yeah. you talk about that? Oh, sure. I, I uh, was wounded on March 9th, which is about the 16th day. I was an executive, executive officer of the company by then. We lost four of our officers by then. Um, and uh, at night, um, we had a rule that anybody above the ground was Japanese. And uh, by then, the Japanese were running out of food and water, so they were coming out of uh, caves at night looking for water and food, and also us. And uh, they, they, they came with grenades, and they'd throw grenades at us, and uh, one came into the foxhole I was in with my corpsman is more like a crater. And um, before I could go off, uh, it killed the corpsman and uh, filled my leg with shrapnel. Fortunately, they put too much TNT in those grenades and it blew the, sh the uh, pieces and uh, the steel into small pieces. But um, mine, I got some in the knee and it immediately got infected. And so I was, I was evacuated three days later. Where were you evacuated to? To a field hospital, at which point they um, numbed the leg and dug out the uh, shrapnel, and um, the infection got cleaned up, and I returned to the company uh, almost 10 days later. 10 days? Yeah. 
having had an infection. Yeah. D did you want to go back? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, you know, on, on the front lines, you, you're fighting for your country, you're, but you're also fighting to keep one another alive. And the more of you back there, uh, the safer. What kind of response did you get from your men when they saw you back there? When they did what? When they saw you return. Well, I think uh, everybody was most pleased that one more person was back there to be available to. Uh, the Japanese were quite famous for bonsai attacks at night. We did not have too much of that on Iwo. We have individuals, a couple or three, and that sort of thing. But uh, their general in subsequent literature that came out did not believe in that. Now what was a bonsai that attack? That was where they would all come running at you uh, firing at night. All at once. They called that a bonsai attack. And they had a, a lot of that at Guadalcanal and uh, other islands uh, before Iwo. Now when you were back and during all of this day-to-day -day confrontation, did you have air or other support coming in? Yeah, we had fantastic support. It was something like 72 days of bombing before we landed, um, strafing, uh, uh, battle wagons uh, firing away for a number of days before we landed and while we were landing. Uh, but uh, they were so dug in that uh, it did a certain amount of damage, certainly, but it, it, um, it was not as effective as everybody had anticipated it would be. You know, there were 21,000 Japs on Iwo, is what the count is, and uh, I think they were all still there when I landed. <laughs> and how many, approximately how many of uh, the Marines were there? Uh, well, we had three divisions, 15 in a division. That's just the line troops. Uh, we were supported, of course, by CBs who handled the beaches and all that problem of keeping things moving, supplies particularly. And we had, in each rifle company, we had artillery spotters and naval spotters, and they were supporting us with artillery and with naval gunfire. At night, it was particularly helpful with the naval gunfire because they fired uh, parachutes with lamps on them, little lamps that would go, would stay lit for about 40 seconds and just light up the area. And that helped us tremendously. Plus, the little parachutes were silk, and we could use them for tourniquets, and and uh, handkerchiefs and or whatever. When you were back, only been being in the hospital for 10 days, yeah. were you in pain? No, not really. Mm -hmm. I was exhausted because we would get relieved for like uh, one night. Because you're awake all night, you don't dare go to sleep. One, one of you is supposed to be awake at all time at each foxhole. But, um, and you do get some, but you're mostly sitting up and you don't really get any sleep. And during the day, you're, of course, on the go. So um, I was totally exhausted, and uh, I slept most of the time. Having been in your foxhole with your corpsmen, yeah. who you must get pretty close to, what, did you meet up with the corpsmen's family after the fact? Oh, yes. It, uh, I think um, we all wrote letters to the parents of those who were in our platoons. We had addresses and that sort of stuff when we got back to Hawaii. We returned to Hawaii after Iwo, where we had been for training. And, uh, and we, we did most of that. We had a lot of personal effects to be set, set back to the families. And, and uh, yes, there were continual correspondence with the family. Did you hear about the progress of the war in other areas, such as in Europe, what was happening there? Well, yes. Uh, How did you hear? We, we had, uh, it didn't take long for a word to, the Philippines were going on at the time, and, and Europe, and uh, we, would get, we would get reports. Um, nothing uh, was as urgent as what was going on immediately in front of us, but I, I do recall that we, the Red Cross was very active on Iwo. They, they came by supplying us with, when we go back for a rear area, they would, we'd go back where there was a little defilade somewhere and just collapse, and they'd put MPs around us uh, to protect us from any Japs who might come out of some caves, and we just collapsed. 
and, uh, and then we go back up the next day. And did you ever have to go into the caves? Uh, no, no, uh, th that was not anything you wanted to do. We had some very bad experiences. Our executive officer was killed because one of the things that were, where all the tunnels were connecting to these various uh, caves and pillboxes, um, we would close them up as we went by, but they could get, open them up again. And our executive officer went over and had one of his demolition guys throw in a couple of charges into this one, and it turned out to be a ammunition dump. And it killed him and everybody around there in the immediate vicinity, and uh, just changed the whole level of the, of the ground. It was a had to be a major one. And so, um, you know, you did not go in. Uh, every, every Japanese sword or anything like that was considered a, a hazard, booby-trapped, and we would blow most, try to blow them up first. How long were you at Iwo Jima? Well, it was uh, 35 days before the island was secured. And the day it was secured, how did you know it was secured? Well, we were at the northern end. I had just returned to the company where by the time I got back, we only had five more days there. We were mostly uh, wiping out last little resistance in, in caves and things like that. And um, we, we, the whole line had just secured the whole fire end of the island. There was no more return fire. Uh, of course, we had air support anyway, and B-29s were now landing on our island, which was the main purpose of it being taken, because uh, the airfields there were Japanese fighter planes were there, and they were shooting down the shooting at the B-29s as they went by from Tinian, which was uh, south of us, and the direct route to, to Japan was right over Iwo, and so we saved an awful lot of B-29s, and they were landing, and then we had fighters on there that went along with the B-29 some of the distance to, uh, for protection. So um, it was a pretty nice feeling to see that what we were there for was to secure that island so that we could take the, the uh, war to Japan homeland with our bombings and be successful at it. So once it was secured, did you get any kind of R&R, &R, uh, time we went, off? We went aboard ship and headed back to to uh, Hawaii, and uh, we had no responsibilities aboard that ship other than to uh, to uh, sleep and uh, get ourselves back to normal. Did you feel a sense of relief, or you had mentioned earlier in the conversation that the reason you joined the Marines was for the action? Did you yeah. sense that okay, I'll rest a while and then go for more, or how did you feel? Well, it was mostly uh, number one. Uh, how come I'm alive? Mm. That's a question that's very that plagues everybody because when you have that kind of casualty, uh, the, the, there's nothing what you did or didn't do uh, in most cases, and uh, so it's a it's an unanswered question, and you're just extremely thankful, and uh, prayer was very much in evidence at all times on Iwo. Were you and a religious man? Yes, I was brought up in the Episcopal Church. I learned to pray to God early on, so I was very much at home and in contact with Him, and uh, and it was that was very helpful. You used the word "plagued" by the fact that you were alive and so many others weren't. Yeah. Did you find that others in your company were also feeling that way, and could you get help or support for that? Yeah. Uh, no, there was nothing, there was no support. Uh, I think what was helpful was that when we got back to Hawaii, uh, uh, replacements started arriving. Um, we got 75% turnover in replacements. Some of the boys that got out of the hospitals returned to us. And, uh, and the enthusiasm of the replacements and the work we had to do to get ready for our invasion of Japan um, kept us so busy that I think that helped tremendously. And did you go to Japan? Yes, we did. The, uh, the bombing, uh, the atomic bomb came down in Hiroshima and Nagasaki on August 7th, and we left the end of August for Japan to go to the southern island of Kyushu, 
uh, in the naval base there, Sasebo, which is one of their largest. And um, we went, it took us a little while to get there, and we went in in wave formation, not knowing what was, we would get for a reception, because in the Marine Corps, we always talk about that 10% that doesn't get the word. Um, but all the civilians had taken off into the mountains. Uh, I'm sure they'd heard awful things about the Marine Corps. And, uh, and, uh, but it didn't take them long to come back down and start selling things to us. But uh, the uh, city itself was pretty much totally demolished from bombing. What was it like to see that? Well, it, it, was, it was alarming to realize uh, the civilians took an awful beating because they're their homes were mostly, you know, made out of wood, and uh, and it just looked like it had been firebombed, and that meant that nobody really had anything to live in. Was there any kind of guilt factor, or did you f get a sense that you and other officers and enlistees felt that it was the right thing to do? There was no guilt feeling on our part whatsoever after, after having lost six thousand fellow Marines at you all. Do you feel you were properly trained and equipped for the combat yes, that you Yes, very found? much so. I, I, I had fired a 22 as a kid. Uh, I had had no exposure to weapons other than that. I had no military training as such. And uh, we were properly trained from A to Z in, the, in 11 months. It was, it was a great feeling. When you f completed your tour in Japan, mm -hmm. were you then discharged or? Well, I seem to, I only signed up once to do, to, to do anything and that's when I joined the Marine Corps. But I seem to have a knack for getting to where the action was. When we, uh, we'd been in Japan blowing up duds and inventorying caves, that was our res responsibility in my area. When we were notified that we were going to board ship, just our battalion, and we were going down right next to the equator to Peleliu, uh, which we had taken earlier on, because there was an island about a half an hour off of Peleliu called Babelthorpe, where the Japs were still firing at everybody that went by. And so our battalion was to go down and tell them the war is over, put them aboard ships and send them to Japan. Uh, not a, a, a good mental test because the war was over and uh, it was difficult to imagine that we were back in it again. But we had a Japanese interpreter and we went up in landing craft and laid off the island and he had a bullhorn and in Japanese he informed everybody in the island that they should be out on that island at attention at daybreak. The war was over and they were going back to Japan, at which time we thought they might try to blow us out of the water and we took off, but they didn't. Went back up, we, the Navy had two large landing crafts, would hold about a couple hundred in each one. And they're all standing at attention. We put them aboard ship, gave them water and K rations, and off they went to Japan. So they weren't prisoners of war. No, no, because no. They, the were, war they, were, was they were a declared. Japanese a unit that was assigned to that island, and they had anti aircraft, and they were shooting at people. And uh, we went aboard, went ashore to make sure we got everybody out of there, and, and um, uh, we did. There wasn't anybody around, uh, military anyway. We found a leprosy colony in there. What was that like? Hmm? What was that like? Well, there was natives that were terribly disfigured with leprosy. We, you know, we courted that off and we didn't go in there. So they stayed on the island? Oh yes, they were, that was their natives, natives of that island, you know. At this point, were you still at the same rank? I was a first lieutenant by now, you know. And then, did you have the ability to come home for a while? Uh, well, yes, we were waiting for transportation to get back to the States, as, as were most everybody out in the Pacific. And you went back by points, and we'd had plenty of points, but... Uh, what do you mean by points? Well, you got points for the number, number of months that you were overseas, the battles you were in, the, the Purple Heart got you some points. So um, we had all those things, and so um, we left right after January 1st. And that would have been in 46? 46, yeah. And we arrived in San Diego on February 19th, exactly to the day that we landed on Iwo the previous year, February 19th. 
And I got to tell you, I was down on my hands and knees kissing that ground. As were, I'm sure, many others. Oh, absolutely. Never thought we'd make it. Although prior to Ewo, no one, no, I never talked to anybody who thought they were going to get killed. I certainly didn't. And did you talk about your experiences once you returned? No, my wife says I never talked about it at all. I had nightmares for a while, but uh, that was, you know, you're starting out. What was, what was very helpful was being busy. New job. And what was your new job? I went to work for the New England Telephone Company. My, when I got back to the West Coast and went back to Pendleton, I got my orders at Boston Navy Yard. And um, some of the fellows were going to uh, be interviewed in the telephone company. I went along and uh, got hired. And uh, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I thought I'd be in something in sales. But it turned out that I was, was in the right place and the right company. And I spent 35 years there. They were at AT&T in New York. Did you join any unit of the military reserve? Oh yes, I was uh, because of my accepting a commission. I was available at the request of the Marine Corps, and uh, I was not going to join a reserve unit. Uh, but I met a colonel of the reserve battalion who I'd met in the, during the war, and he wanted to know what I was doing. And I told him I was working with the telephone company. He said, "Why don't you come down and join the reserve?" And I said. Colonel, the Marine Corps and I came out even. They gave me an education that I badly needed, and I'm alive. So I'm really not interested. He said, well, why don't you come down and meet some of the fellows? There'll be a whole group of guys that you'll know there. And he said, if we have another war, you're going to get called up anyway. And besides, we'll pay you, you captain now, we'll pay you captain's pay uh, Sundays, and uh, the telephone company gives you two weeks vacation with the military in addition to your regular vacation. So I went down to see who the fellows were, and I did. I met a whole group of guys, and so I signed up, and I'm now company commander, and, uh, and I enjoyed it. And it, I was almost making as much money as I was in the telephone company. And uh, So you could do both? I could, well, it was only Sunday afternoons. So we had to take correspondence courses to keep up, and uh, we had to go to camp two weeks every year. But that, that was all, so it really didn't interfere with it. I was working in Boston for the telephone company, so I was accessible to the Fargo building, so that, that worked out. And um, I could use the money, and uh, it, was, it was a good group of guys, and we had a great time. And uh, the minute Korea happened, we got 30 days notice, so in July of 1950, I went back in the Marine Corps. We right, marched from the Fargo building down to the South Station and off to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and we formed the 2nd Marine Division. And every Marine in the base had, had left for uh, Korea. And uh, so uh, we had quarters. Uh, we had very nice officers' quarters. My wife and our, we had two children by then came. And, and uh, we were there for 18 months, at which time it was decided that the, after the choice on reservoir uh, experience, uh, we were not going to cross into China, and the war ended. And so I returned to. Uh, the telephone company. So prior to returning, did you, were you a teacher at Camp Lejeune? What were oh, you I was doing? a company commander of a, a, a weapons company, yeah. And training yeah. these young Yeah, they're all young kids. fellows. In fact, uh, Harry Aganis was in our reserve battalion. A lot of the athletes and, and others around Boston area joined the Marine Reserve uh, so they could continue, and he was at BU. And, he was in our company for a while, but they, it wasn't long before he was an outstanding quarterback for the Camp Lejeune football team, which was all right. We all went and watched him and enjoyed it very much. And you said you had your family there. Yes. Had you heard about a lot of the casualties with regards oh, to the yes. Korean conflict? We had some of the fellows arriving back that had been frostbitten, their hands were a terrible mess. And, uh, yes, we were very much up to date on exactly what was going on at Korea. And, and we were starting to pack our, we had finished our division training, the second division was ready to go, and we were starting to pack when it was called off. So I survived one more time. And did you feel, especially because you had more responsibilities now, you said you had a family, you had children, yeah. did you feel a sense of relief at that time? Well, no, but I, I at this point in time I had to decide whether I wanted to maybe stay in the Marine Corps permanently or 
or the telephone company. And I really enjoy the telephone company. And they had a, quite a program for the future because they did no hiring throughout the whole depression. And so we were the first young group to come into the company. And the, there were great opportunities, as there were for many young fellows in most businesses. And so I made the decision. Uh, Marine Corps, by the way, said any officer that was now on inactive duty and had been in World War II and Korea could resign their commission, at which point after much gnawing of teeth and so forth, I, I resigned. It wasn't easy because I had given an awful lot. What year was that? Do you remember? Yes, uh, that was April 1952, exactly two years to the month because I joined in April of 42. Did you join any veterans organizations? Yes, I've been a member of the American Legion. I play in, the, play in the Waltham American Legion Band. I have for 16 years. I uh, played in the trombone in, in college and uh, hadn't played it for 40 years, but when I retired, I thought, gee, this would be a good thing to do. Take it up again. And so I had a great time. I was, did that for 16 years until two years ago. And did you receive any veterans benefits? Um, uh, no, I really didn't. Um, I rented uh, a house, uh, apartment. We rented an apartment, then a house. And um, no, I did not. Uh, I had my degree, so I had no education that I was going to pursue. And uh, until recently, when I was getting hearing aids and that sort of thing, uh, I had not really used the veterans. So currently you do, or you can, you I, have that oh, option. Yes, I, I have, they don't work, but uh, I had that opportunity to find out. And you mentioned reunions. Talk about some of the reunions of your old outfit. Well, I've, you know, I've been to high school and college reunions, but this is a, and they're great, but this is, this is very special because we have fellows uh, in wheelchairs with one leg, one arm, one eye, and they were, we knew them when they were just like we are. Uh, we also, uh, a number of the fellows, uh, the corpsmen that were there at the reunion saved their lives, kept them from bleeding to death. And, and uh, it's a very close relationship, very close and, uh, and very special. You know, I, How important do you feel um, serving in the military was for you? It, it was it, it was a wonderful experience. I, you know, I was 19 years old. The only discipline I ever had was in sports, other than my parents. And um, I, I didn't realize what this great brotherhood, the United States Marine Corps was. I, it's, it's a very strong relationship. Uh, seldom do I go to any conferences that I don't, Marines just seem to surface out of the group from nowhere. We're, we're, we are a great brotherhood, and that experience was, was terrific. Uh, uh, being a member of your country's uh, armed forces is a, is a wonderful experience. I, I, I'm totally for some kind of program that gives all those who are physically able to participate, spend two years in the military. It was, a, it was that important for me. So you wouldn't be adverse to doing something like some of the other countries do where it's almost a mandatory thing. Yes, I, I think there, there are some fellows who are not, should not be in the military, but they could go to the Peace Corps or other things like that. Yes, I, I think that's a great experience. I think it's a room for it at that time of your life to do this between high school and college or part through college somewhere along there. And it would, uh, it, especially if you're working for a large company, as I was in the Bell System, uh, to, to have that background, the discipline of taking orders. Uh, you may not agree with the orders, but you, you follow it out completely, and that's, that's a maturing experience. And a, and a great opportunity to, to improve your leadership skills and communication skills and all those things. You mentioned a humorous experience. How about a memorable character or a memorable experience? I mean, certainly you've given us plenty to think about, yeah. but anything special that stands out that you haven't mentioned? 
Well, the, the ones at, at boot camp that uh, I, I got a big kick out of, uh, the injured Marine that I told you about that uh, thought he'd died and gone to heaven, those are the ones that come to my mind. Uh, going up and down landing nets off of, uh, uh, off of uh, large ships, uh, they call them troop ships. That's how we got off the ship onto landing craft, was go down these nets. And uh, we practiced that an awful lot because uh, the, the school of thought was that you did not strap your helmet underneath your chin because if you fell off and hit the water, you'd probably break your neck. But um, we insisted on it because they came off and came down and landed on those who were in the landing craft. <laughs> so we said, we don't. If your helmet comes off your head and you break your neck, it's your fault, not ours. So we made them keep their helmets strapped on. Uh, that always got a lot of conversation going. We had uh, a fun time aboard ship. Uh, for the enlisted, a lot of standing around in lines waiting for meals and, and other things, but it was, a, it was a nice life aboard ship. And when the Marine Corps uh, him is the only military uh, song, medley, if you will, that talks about you're going to fight. The others talk, the Army talks about traveling, the Navy talks about sailing around the world, the Air Corps flying all around. None of them mention the fact that you're going to be fighting. Uh, I, I always enjoy that story. Thinking now above all like one thought or incident or anything additionally that you would like to add to this wonderful tape that you've yeah. done for us for not only your family but for others who will be listening yeah. to this and watching this. I would encourage everyone to go to Washington to visit the World War II Memorial. I think it's a, a great national shrine. Uh, it. it uh, it helps people remember. And um, I just hope that we don't have to go to too many wars, but to defend, to defend our freedom, whatever the penalty, um, that's our responsibility as, as citizens. William Eckerson, thank you yes. so much. You're welcome, Joe.